Hey, I'm Dr. Greg Ellis. Today we're going to talk about the glycemic index. The glycemic index. This is the hub of many of the top selling diet books of the last decade. Now, how did the glycemic index come about? Well, when fat got trashed back in the 1950s, everybody had the recommendation to replace those fat calories, which are nine calories per gram, with carbohydrates, believing that carbohydrates were innocuous, that they would not create any problems. And that, of course, was not true. In 1981-82, the first discussion of the glycemic index of different foods came about from four professors at the University of Toronto. So what is the glycemic index? How does it work? What is it a test of? Well, what they did is fed 50 gram portions of carbohydrate-containing foods to subjects and then measured their blood sugar or glucose response to that 50 gram portion. And then they made a listing of all these different foods and they argued that the glycemic index would tell us which foods we could use, carbohydrate foods we could use, which would not create a lot of problems with our diet. Now this was particularly developed for the use in diabetics. Diabetics were having problems seemingly with the carbohydrates, so they weren't as innocuous as people thought they were. Now, the blood sugar level would rise, and the glycemic index had nothing to do at all with insulin. They did not measure insulin at the same time. It was just the glucose response. And they set a, a level of 100 as the neutral level, which was equal to that of table sugar. And this index ranged from low numbers of about high 20s all the way up to the 130s. What came out of this, of course, later on, was that the glycemic index was useless. It was totally worthless. And hardly anyone is even aware of that. And what also came out of this was this whole notion that became very popular about the spikes in insulin and glucose. And that's part of what I call the net carb scam that developed when the carb diet became very, very popular. People were concerned about how high the insulin level was rising in the blood and the glucose level. Now remember, again, insulin was never implicated with the glucose, although studies did begin to come out where they measured both the glucose response and the insulin response. Now, here's how insulin works. Its primary job is to control the release of fat from the fat cell and also dictate the burning of fat in the body's tissues. At rest, in the morning, the basal insulin level, and this is our, our balance point, or this is where we start, is about eight to 10 micro units of insulin per volume of blood. That's the base, and that's in normal weight people. In the obese, it's as high as 40. Now, how does insulin work as ma magic? What number, what number of units of insulin do we need to affect fat burning? Well, by the time insulin gets up from its basal to about 18 microunits per milliliter, fat burning, fat release, is shut down by about 50%. So that's all it takes. By 30 units, the re release of fat is shut down and the burning of fat is decreased by about 50%. And by 34 units, all burning and all release of fat is shut down. So what happens then with the insulin levels in response to these different foods? Turns out that insulin levels can go up to two, 300, 500 microunits. And certainly in the obese, even their basal level that they have in the morning of about 40 units, all fat burning is shut down. So the whole idea that a spike makes some kind of difference, it does not matter. So because one food will increase your insulin level up to 40 units, another will send it to 60, another will send it to 200, does not matter. Physiologically, it's all been shut down by that. So it's like a dimmer switch. And people are so concerned about this idea of spikes in glucose and insulin and that obviously whole books have been written. And I was just, I've been reviewing some of Gary Taub's work, and he is convinced 
that the idea of spikes is relevant. Now, the other thing they found out in the first published study in the early 1980s was that fiber made no difference in respect to how rapidly glucose was released into the blood. But this is a common belief today that fiber is very, very important to prevent the so-called spikes in insulin and glucose, and it has nothing to do with it all. So the glycemic index is totally worthless, totally useless, not meaningful in any way, and we should really be paying no attention to it at all. It has no role in our dietary thing. So if we're going to do a low-carbohydrate diet and then talk about using the carbohydrate foods that we want to include in our, in our diet, particularly those that don't spike insulin and glucose, there's no sense even thinking about it. Because at the end of the day, any and all glucose you consume will enter the blood, regardless of how long it took to get there. If it took three hours, four hours, six hours, it does not matter. So that's the glycemic index. So avoid listening to anyone who's telling you the glycemic index is of value. It's not. So that's the tip for the day. I'm Dr. Greg Ellis.